All right, Emilia, welcome to the Biohacking Beauty Podcast. How are you? Good. Thank you so much, Amate, for inviting me to be here. I'm excited to talk about lymph and skin and health. Yeah, and uh, honestly, that's my pleasure. We've, we've been kind of running into each other for the last, more or less for the last year in different events, different uh, conferences. Uh, I enjoy your company. I don't know if you enjoy my company so much, but uh, I enjoy your company every time. And, and I'm very, very happy we, we could sit down in this format and maybe have other people, you know, uh, share some of the inter- interesting conversations that we that we have. Yeah, I know. Definitely. I enjoy you and your wife. Is it your wife or your girlfriend? I think it's your uh, wife. No, right? life partner. Life partner. Life partner, yeah. Yeah, so you're, yes. I just love you guys so much, too. That's why we keep coming back to the booth and, <laughs> you know, talk about it. And I was like, I think it's really interesting, right? Because skincare and biohacking and health is something that I recently, especially being a cancer survivor, like that's something that really dear and close to my heart because mm-hmm. skin is your largest lymphatic organ. I don't know if you know that. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, that's why I was like, I'm so excited to be here and just chat with you. So Amelia, really, how did you, how did you start that that uh, lymphatic journey? Um, what what brought you to where you are today? Which honestly, you're one of the most uh, knowledgeable people on that subject that I, that I know, and 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 definitely uh, in our kind of biohacking community, you're almost like the go-to person to to go to as far as like the fatic drainage so how did you even start that journey um so i started actually in grad school when i was in grad school as an occupational therapist for my doctorate program uh, my project was um, prehabilitation for breast cancer Mm -hmm. so my mentors were lymphedema specialists so that's how i found about lymphedema and lymphatic technique because i was like well this is so interesting right because before that my experience was treating patients with neurological conditions so patient with stroke patient with brain injury So as an occupational therapist, I love to help them, but the change that you see in those patients can be minimal to like a lot. It depends on the stage of the patient that you see. But with lymphedema treatment, what I realized is that when you apply it at the right time, it number one, it changed so much of the patient quality of life. It is so effective and it can change someone's life really fast. So that's how I got into like lymphedema management realm through my training. And then when I become a clinician, I get certified. And then the more I learn about lymphedema, actually, the more I learned about the lymphatic. So I think that's really interesting because as a healthcare professional, I'm used to looking at systems, broken systems, right? Lymphedema are people who have disrupted lymphatic system. That's why they have accumulation of fluid in their limbs. So they can have it either in their arm, their legs, their genitals, their face, any, any part in the body that can be affected by the lymphatic system. So we look at it from that side. It's like, okay, how can we help people that already have a disrupted lymphatic system? But when I become a patient myself, I realize that, hey, everybody has lymphatic system and your lymphatic system is actually a part of your immune system and is part of your filtration system. So if we don't clear it, it actually can lead to a lot of health issues. That's kind of like where I guess my understanding of the lymphatics have evolved over time because I was like, at first I was like, well, let's, treat this. Let's make you better. Right. But then now it's like, well, everybody has lymphatic system. Can we prevent you and I for having issues when we are 70? Right. Cause right now mm-hmm. I'm 38. I still have good lymphatics. I still have good Venus, but actually Venus insufficiency rate in America is quite high. I think it's like, I want to say it's 40% from oh. what I've heard last. So Venus insufficiency is a pretty common condition when your veins is not pumping blood back to the lakes as much. So you start having this accumulation of fluid in the lakes that can turn into wounds over time. So that's kind of like the reason why I actually joined Instagram is because I was like, well, if I raise awareness right now, right? Hopefully I met you when you were in your younger years. Hopefully you listen to health advices. So then when you're 70, you will not need my service. That's my goal is to get it on my job, basically. Under- understood. That's very interesting. So maybe um, we can start at the beginning of what are what are lymphs in general what are the lymph nodes what is the lymphatic system uh and how does it work or how does um how does it function obviously it doesn't have a a heart attached to it a pump etc so uh maybe we talk about the basics of, of lymphatics and go from there yeah absolutely so your lymphatic system is a part of your circulation system right it works alongside your veins and your arteries to move fluid in your body 
So with the lymphatic system, though, the main function is not circulation, but the main function is actually filtration and immune system. So mm -hmm. that's why, you know, like that's where your B cells are made. That's where your T cells are made. So they're all part of the lymphatic system. So your kidney, your um, sister Nakaili, uh, your lymphatic organs are all working together to help you at homeostasis and balance and, and balance because you can only, so your body has a certain capacity on how much it can handle a lymphatic fluid in the body. So let's just say everybody's slightly different. So let's just say you can handle one liter, right? Of lymphatics. Mm -hmm. But when you have scars, you have injuries, you have lymph nodes removal because of cancer, that can cause your lymphatic system to be underperforming. So mm -hmm. if you think about if you have a car, right? Your car was running good the first year, right? And then the second year you have like, you have an accident and then your axle is not in no longer in alignment. So you start noticing that your car doesn't work as well. And mm -hmm. then eventually it's going to lead to more problems if you don't fix it, right? Our lymphatic system is the same way. Like it works like a car in the beginning, but then you start adding trauma to it. You start adding lymph nodes removal. Um, you start adding bad habits and inflammation from your food and all that stuff, right? It all yeah. clogs the lymphatic. So over time, the performance is lower, but then because our lymphatic system has no built-in recovery system, it will get overwhelmed. And that's when you start having fluid overload in different places. So and, uh -huh. continue. Yeah. No, so my, that's that's very interesting. So you did mention before that you want to meet people when they're young and healthy and not have to deal with them later on. And that is kind of the reason you went into um in, into into basically into advocacy, right? Into social media, et cetera. So what would um people who are functioning well, what should they do in order to keep that uh that system functioning? optimally because that's what in the end you know the, that's what this podcast is about this podcast is about saying yes we're a skincare company we will take care of your skin we'll make the best products for your skin but if you're not going to maintain your body performing optimally our products are not going to perform optimally your skin's gonna, not going to look uh, uh, optimal etc and it's important to understand that all of these systems are are connected so yes when we are performing uh, optimally, how do we keep it that way from a lymphatic standpoint? That's a really good question. And I, I, I think you're absolutely right, right? With lymphatic standpoint, it's not just the compression pump. It's not just the compression leggings, but it's a lot of things in between. So I'm going to go back and just talk about the lymphatic nodes really quick, and then I'll make that mm -hmm. connection back to the, um, the whole picture, right? So lymphatic nodes, you have about 600 to 700 in the bodies. And what it does, it does, it helps to, number one, to do the filtration. And number two, it also helps to identify pathogens in your body. So mm -hmm. that's why when you have cancer, the first thing that the doctor will check is your lymphatic nodes because your lymphatic nodes will be working actively to fight the pathogens and the extra, you know, like the cancer cells, like, you know, toxic things that are in your body to kind of fight it out. Mm -hmm. um, so, and guess what? A third of your lymph nodes is in the stomach. And guess where the other third is? I would say uh, next to the genitals and then your neck on your neck would be, uh, or in the armpits. Neck. Okay. So this interesting thing, like people think, okay, when we think about lymph nodes, we think about the one in the groin and one in the armpit, but actually the most collection is in the stomach, one third of it, and the other third is in the neck. Mm -hmm. And guess why? Because your lymphatic nodes is part of your filtration and immune system, right? So where did you interact with the world? Through your yep. mouth, right? Because of your food. And then guess where the food goes to? To your stomach. That's why you need the lymph nodes in those areas. Mm -hmm. So going back to your question earlier, like how can a young person have a good lymphatic system? So number one, as I said, lymphatic nodes is in the neck and the mouth, food. That's something that I think a lot of people don't talk about, but even in the lymphedema community, we were told a long time ago that your diet has nothing to do with your lymphatic. And I was like, um, no, <laughs> right? Because I watch my patient all the time. Like I have a patient who told me that he has swelling in his leg for years and guess what he drinks every day. This is a businessman who owns a lot of land in Texas. He drinks Dr. Pepper every day, no water. So we start doing treatment, right? And then his legs was getting better and it's looking better, but his skin is still very dry. You know this because you're in skincare business. So I was like, I basically coax him like, Hey, you know, why don't you start drinking a cup of water this week? And then the mm -hmm. next week I give him a homework to do two cups of water. And then guess what? Two weeks later, his skin is improving. His dryness is going away and he's 
I was able to discharge him. So wow. your water intake matters. And you probably already talk about it with other experts, but the quality of your water matters, right? You know that. So yeah. I use, this is not a sponsored podcast, but I use um, Berkey water to help like filter, filter a lot of things because most Americans drink water from the tap, but Texas especially, and I think Miami too, we have really bad water. Yep. Even for yep. shower, I use actually a shower filter too, because like I said, your skin is your biggest lymphatic organ. Because where, where do you get bacteria and pathogens? From your breath, from your food, and you're from your skin, right? Yeah. And kind of going back to skincare, and this is why I'm you know, like excited that you guys are in the field because I was like, for years, I put really bad skincare on my face. You know, the one that has parabens, the one that has all of these preservative, right? Really bad quality ingredients because the United States only bans 70 ingredients. While in Europe, and especially, you know, you're from Israel. So, you know, Israel bans so many things from US. Correct. <laughs> Correct. So, and, and, you know, obviously the, the problem that we have in, in the US is just the problem of it's not even a problem of awareness. It's a problem of, of not only bad diet with the food that we eat, but bad diet with the, the information that we consume. Really, uh, there is very there is lack of education as far as what what our body, how our body functions, what we should expose our body to, what we shouldn't expose. And unfortunately, yeah, no one talks about uh, what's in your water, what's in the water that goes in or, into your body, and what what's in your water that goes on your skin. And um, both are very, very, very important. We can see a lot of uh, remnants of, you know, medicine. People throw down their 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 sink, uh, anything from from medicine to really things that seep into the water. Here, we're in Florida. There's a lot of golf courses uh, that contaminate the water. So yeah, that's very important to 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 figure out and and try to avoid. Yeah, I mean that's one thing, right? But basically, your lymphatic system, how does it get clogged, right? Because it clogs because it, it keeps filtrating all of the foreign bacteria and stuff like that. So when you want to clear out your lymphatic system, you got to watch what's coming in, right? So we talk about that. So that is your skincare, that is your lotion, your soap, mm -hmm. your water, um, everything that you put on your body, your clothes, actually. Like I didn't know that, um, you know, like new clothes, you're not supposed to wear it right away because they preserve it with formaldehyde. I was like, oh, wow, I didn't know that. You know, like those are the little things that I don't know about, but. I was like, it matters because whatever you put on your body actually counts. Uh -huh. You know, like I, when I work in a hospital, we use sani wipes and uh -huh. I used to use the sani wipes with my bare hand until I got a pink eye because I touched my finger after and then I stopped using. But I've seen so many people use sani wipes with their bare hand. I mean, imagine how much chemicals going through your hand at that point. It's like yeah. so unhealthy for you. And we're healthcare people. And we're supposed to know this, but we don't. That's a scary part. Yeah, that's that's true. I, well, that that's a whole different discussion because the healthcare system, the normal health healthcare system, you know, you're gonna get to uh to the to to some very 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 uh, infected people, people with with uh, non healing ulcers, people that their body just is not functioning correctly. They're gonna go to you're gonna see what they're feeding them for lunch, and it's going to be basically literal poison. So. Uh, that's it. that system to me is is uh, very scary to get into and and again and like we're going back to trying to preserve what is functioning correctly. The most important is trying not to get into that system. So yeah, so, so yeah, absolutely. When when we're uh, dealing with the way that we look and the way that the lymphatic system kind of affects how we look, um, we we also kind of. In, in conversation, we also spoke about trauma and we spoke about um, uh, fascia with you. So how do these kind of connect between, you kind of mentioned uh, trauma a little bit, but how do you, you know, bridge the gap uh, between those um, systems and, and how do they uh, affect each other? That's so interesting, right? Because um, I learned fascia work through John Barnes and mm -hmm. he talked about how your fascia is supposed to look like chicken skin, how it's like not chicken skin, you know what? Your fascia is supposed to be watery and very, very bendable and flexible, right? Mm -hmm. It's almost like a raw meat. Let's just put it that way. That's how mm -hmm. it's supposed to. But when you actually store trauma in your fascia, so when you keep storing trauma in the fascia, it can be from physical trauma, right? You can have an accident and mm -hmm. you got a rear ended and then you have whiplash, right? Mm -hmm. So 
when you don't deal with that trauma, it actually becomes a broken record in your neck, right? It just keeps like traumatized, traumatized, traumatized. <laughs> so then your body is still keeping getting that tension because you never actually finish that trauma process. Mm -hmm. So that's why people with bad car accident, they can have neck pain for years to come because they never actually finish that trauma. So what John Barnes said also is that once you, you know, your um, fascia becomes traumatized, it becomes hard like a beef jerky. So you think about mm -hmm. the consistency of a steak versus a jerky, which one mm -hmm. do you want on your body? Definitely the steak. Exactly. You don't want the jerky. So that's why with the fascia, it can get traumatized that way. And um, like, you know, like I had this laser that I use and with the laser, it actually can um, work on trigger points and loosen up that trigger points. So there was a lady in this group that I'm a part of, of laser users, and she wants to stop using Botox, right? I mean, you guys know about how, yeah, I, I am not a proponent of Botox. Mm -hmm. So, um, but she started using this laser on her face on the trigger points, right? And she uses um, CBD cream and mm -hmm. her face, she did a, a two months after before and after, and it looks like she just had Botox just by working trigger points in your face. So I noticed that too, because recently I have gotten four energy work where it helped me release my emotional trauma. Mm -hmm. And literally after every session, the person look at me and they're like, you look younger. You look like, wow. right. But I mean, if you think about it, it makes sense, right? When you have a lot of trauma in your life, you have a lot of sadness. Guess what your face does? Yes. Right? It makes like, you know, when you feel that emotion coming in, you know, your face crunch in, right. And yeah. it's tight. And when you're stressed, like going back to like your first question, how do you keep your lymphatic strong? Managing your stress early on as an Asian woman, I was told my whole life that we don't talk about our emotion. We just move past it. You go, keep going, you keep grinding. Right. But yeah. what is it to you? It stores trauma in your body because you never let it out. So you become, I mean, you, you met people, right? You met people and you're like, you meet somebody and they're like, wonderful. And they have good energy. You want to be with them. Mm -hmm. And then you met people and then you look at them and you know, they have a lot of trauma in their life, right? Yeah. How do you know that? It's their energy and their fascia. You can see the wrinkles look the same. Their face may be a little bit more uneven. There's actually a, uh, a physician who studies facial expression. And they were saying that one side is slightly always more, um, I guess, wrinkled or something on, on one side, because that's where you store your trauma. And it's very fascinating because if you start looking at your face only half, you start seeing the, the difference in your face. Definitely. And now with filters, we, you know, there are people who are doing filters and, and kind of look, having uh, their half of their face compared to the other side, and they almost look like two different people. So definitely. And, and I do think there is a lot to it as far as like storing stress storing trauma, how it affects us long term, how it kind of, you know, as I as I say often, uh, we know that every cell in our body basically changes and that within seven years, we're literally a different person, every, ch every cell in our body changed. So what are the instructions we're giving those cells, you know, when they change, what are, what is some of the um, mistakes that happen because of that increased, whether it's tension, inflammation, stress, hormones that are, uh, you know, stress hormones that are elevated and cause, you know, mis genetic mistakes to happen. All of those things, they're almost like when people come to us and they tell us, oh, I'm filling the blank. I'm 45, 50 years old. I have wrinkles. I have sun damage. I have whatever. They're talking about things that they want to correct because it is in the end damage that or mistakes that have been accumulating over time. And the best thing we can recommend them, obviously we have products to help them with that, but the best thing that we could recommend them is to try and maybe mitigate some of the future mistakes that are going to happen or talking to a, a younger person in their 30s and telling them that unless they're going to reduce their stress levels, deal with their trauma, um, again, release whatever whatever damage or, or you know strain that they're dealing with currently in their life, they are going to come to us in 10 years and they're going to already have a completely different conversation with us. How do I reverse some of it in, instead of, uh, you know, obviously preventing it. So that's, that's extremely important. Now, as far as trying to tie up lymphatic drainage and, and uh, beauty right now, we, we see a lot of um, information circulating in social media and in general about uh, gua sha facial massages and the way that they are supposedly 
helping through the lymphatic system. What have you seen as far as that? Is, is it something that, that helps the lymphatic truly? Do you see it helping with, with the skin in general? What, what's your take on it? So kind of like going back to releasing the tight fascia, right? I think yeah. gua sha helps with that because gua sha is actually ancient Chinese, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, we've been using it for a while. Um, my mom used to make me coin her. So whenever she gets sick, she would give me a coin and then I would rub it with tiger balm in the back of her. Mm-hmm. You know, you've seen that, right? Like you, you coin yeah. them and then it becomes red. So we've used gua sha for a long time to release, like we call it to release, um, we call it hot air, not hot air. The cold air, I guess. Like you don't want the cold air. I mean, Chinese is all about balance and stuff like that. So you believe mm-hmm. that when you're sick, you're actually catching the cold wind. So mm-hmm. by us coining, you're actually releasing that cold air. So anyway, all that's today. With gua sha, I feel like what it does, number one, it releases some of that tension in the skin, right? Mm-hmm. And then I think the way I've been seeing instruction too on people really use it on their tight muscle in the jaw. Because again, fascia and lymphatics are related because lymphatic mm-hmm. is right underneath your skin. So imagine if your fascia, which is like right around the same place, gets tight, right? It also yes. clogs up the lymphatics because lymphatic is tightly interconnected with them. And your lymphatic is supposed to be fluidy and moving. So when you have a lot of fascia tightness, it's going to block the lymphatics. So with mm-hmm. the gua sha, what it does is that it loosens up your fascia. It helps reduce the t- tension in the trigger points, and then it allows your lymphatics to move better. And then, of course, they usually follow it with some lymphatic drainage technique to help move the fluid. The mm-hmm. lymphatic notes. So it's actually good, but you got to watch it because I feel like people can get over eager when it comes to like, oh, I want to get this moving, right? Mm-hmm. With lymphatics, it's, you don't need a lot if you don't have a lot of scars in your face. Now, if you have surgeries, which I kind of want to talk about because you're from Miami, the amount of plastic surgeries that our country is doing right now is crazy. And I'm telling you, like, I'm not in, you know, like I, I, yes, you are free to choose whatever you want to do with your body. But when you come to surgery, right, we talk about lymphatic system, how the lymphatic fluid is part of your immune system. So think about people who has multiple surgeries. Whenever you cut somebody open, it tells your body, Hey, there's a, you know, infiltration from the outside world. Let's rush with the lymphatics and save all of these cells around them. Mm -hmm. Right. So there's an increase of lymphatic activity whenever you have surgery. That's why you have post-surgical swelling. So if you think about those patients that has liposuction, they do like nip tuck, they, they do things to their face, all that, you know, just for cosmetically and they don't get lymphatic drainage. Actually, a lot of them develop, this is a totally different subject and they're more um, trained phys- um, massage therapists who can talk about this more, but it, they develop fibrosis in their, mm-hmm. the places where their um, fat was suctioned out and they actually need more treatment out of it. So you think that you're getting rid of your fat but you're actually creating more problems down the line for yourself. And is it something that can be avoided? If you know, if you do do the right moves, you know, the right steps as far as lymphatic care, is it something that can be avoided? It can be minimized, mm-hmm. right? Because if you do lymphatic drainage, I think I know a massage therapist who do it like within a day or two days after um, the procedure, like patients recover better and they have better results. Now, however, I have to distinguish because in Miami, there are a ton of lymphatic drainage that try to push the fluid yeah. out of the incision. Now, that is not something that we in the lymphatic community condone because we believe that it actually can cause more infection, right? Because you're putting yeah. fluid into a freshly fresh scar. Like that is a no-no. Like you want to keep that nice and dry as possible so the scar can heal. But mm-hmm. I saw videos of therapists who's massaging and they're pushing the f- fluid that it comes out of the scar. I cringe thinking about the amount of infection that's going to happen out of that. Yeah, definitely. You know, surgeries are becoming, especially like aesthetic surgeries, are becoming more and more and more prevalent, also prevalent in different parts of the body that that are that maybe weren't that important for people to operate on, um, you know, 20, 30, 40 years ago. So definitely we need to be weary of fresh techniques, no pun intended, as far as as, uh, how to deal with them. Uh, What we see here in Miami, obviously, is a lot of people doing, um, we're not going to say surgery, but a lot of people are doing controlled damage to their skin. So whether it would be like uh, CO2 lasers, whether it would be microneedling with radiofrequency, whether it would be 
um, dermaplaning, but things really that are causing some kind of minimized or controlled trauma to the skin in hopes for the skin to renew itself. And there are many, you know, challenges as far as, um, as far as creating results with, with these systems. The first is that you really, as you've mentioned before, you, you really are um, using resources that your skin or your body was planning on using later on in their in, in its life, right? You're you're making cells split and renew themselves faster than they would have normally, which which could be good if if you're interested in looking good right now. But long term, you might be exhausting those cells and how they function. Um, and again, when we're talking about scarring, we are creating underlying scarring, per, you know, potentially especially if we're going through something like microneedling or microneedling with radio frequency, we're really creating scarring, which would later on, if we did want to do something more extreme like surgery, it's actually making it more difficult. So right. that's why, yeah, that's why a lot of the times uh, when, when people consult me, consult us, whether they should do something, I remind people that whatever treatment they wanted to do didn't exist five, 10 years ago. And if they just waited another five, 10 years and maybe uh, focused more on minim minimalistic, you know, solutions for their skin issues, they might encounter new treatments that might be better for them, you know? Um, so th that, that is really something to consider as far as heavy duty cosmetic procedures. But obviously some people, they can't wait, they need things right now. Um, do you have any anything else to add as far as um, things that you have seen that help you know skin health or facial facial health and uh, appearance? Cleaning your diet. I mean, you know, yes. I've been doing my, um, you know, I've been I've been journeying with cancer for a year and a half now, and I changed my mm -hmm. diet completely. And, you know, like before I'm on my new protocol, which is strictly keto right now, but before mm -hmm. that I was doing a lot of juicing coffee enema, gallbladder cleanse. And I've just like, everybody told me all the time. It's like, oh, your skin looks great. Your skin looks great. What are you using? I was like, well, actually I'm not really using anything. I use like this natural oil and stuff, mm -hmm. but I change my diet and I clean up my system. I clean up my gut. And that helps a lot because, you know, like I said, your gut and your head is connected, right? With the lymphatics, with everything else, there's a gut and brain connection. We know that your gut is your second brain. So when you're not taking care of your gut, you're actually causing more inflammation and it will show on your skin. So, I mean, if you want to have good skin, but then you drink beer every day and you have slight gluten intolerance, you're probably not creating a good habit for your skin, right? And this is not me picking on alcohol or anything. I mean, everybody should be able to enjoy whatever they want, but you, number one, you need to know your limit. And number mm -hmm. two, you need to know how your body responds to it. Because as you age, you may have different responses to your body. Like I did a food sensitivity test and I find out that I have food slight food reaction to chia seeds. I mean, chia really? seeds are supposed to be good for you, right? But I know my body now have reactions to it. So when I eat it, I'm going to cause increased inflammation. And I think that's what we don't measure is that inflammation, like how much is too much, right? You know, sometimes you eat something and your body feel bloated, right? I mean, you probably yeah. should be thinking, well, what do I eat that makes me feel bloated? Maybe I shouldn't eat it again. But in our world, it's like, oh, we feel bloated because we just ate a whole bunch of food. We'll do it again next time. So I yeah. think it's a slight different perspective because, you know, you can look at your body and, and I'm telling you, your body is so smart that when you honor your body and you actually ask the body what it wants, it's going to tell you. But for a long time, we don't do that. We just like, well, I want a burger. Let me finish it right now. Right. But now, like, if I actually listen to my body, I know when I need to stop eating. Yes, 100%. You know, first of all, a lot of people are unaware of the, of the term inflammaging, which is how inflammation causes, you know, or in, increases aging. And in general, when we talk about food, so I asked you, oh, what's better for the skin? You immediately said, clean, clean up your diet. So research has shown that our biological age, so not the chronological age, the age that our true age, the, the age that our cells are, are uh, you know, their true age basically, is directly correlated to the um, age that you look. 
uh, or your apparent age. So I can be, my chronological age can be 35, but my biological age can be 25, and I'm going to look more like a 25-year-old than a 35-year-old or someone who's 50, but their biological age because they are smoking or they have a bad diet or they are um, frequenting uh, McDonald's or whatever too often, uh, and their, their biological age is 60, they're going to look more close to 60-year-old than to a 50-year-old. So okay. that's the, yeah, that's the first thing we need to understand that if we want to look better, the first thing we need to do is to eat better, is to take care of our body. We just had a, a customer write to us, you know, I've been using your product for a long time. I'm absolutely in love with them, but something happened in the last two weeks. Did you change something in your formulation? Something happened the last time I ordered it. Uh, so I, obviously we didn't, we, we asked her, so what <laughs> other life? What, what other life changes did you did you have? So apparently she she obviously she got really sick and things like that and and um, those things matter. It's not it's not a, our body is intertwined. We're going to take care of the of our lymphatic system. It's going to you know uh, evacuate um, waste from our cells better. It's going to take care of pathogens better, which obviously affect our age and actually. Something very important. So we are we are um, obviously heavily invested in raising NAD levels in the skin. That's our whole spiel as a company. That's the basis to, to everything that we do well. Is we're raising that essential molecule that's called NAD that fuels repair processes, about six hundred processes in the body, lowers with age, and and it's a ma major culprit in aging. Uh, the person who discovered it won a Nobel Prize, etc. But uh, so it's it is known that within thirty to sixty, about fifty percent of it, uh, you you have a decrease of about fifty percent. What people don't know is part of that uh, decrease is happening because of an enzyme called CD thirty mm. eight, and CD thirty eight that breaks down in AD really goes up with age when NAD goes down with age. And one of the things that affect CD38 the most are pathogens, actually, um, um, you know, mainly like uh, foodborne pathogens that ex getting exposed to them on a regular basis increases CD38. So we can see how if we're not eating, you know, the right foods, if we're eating contaminated food, food basically, we're gonna be affecting directly almost the normal repair processes in the body, which obviously we can understand how they're going to be affecting our skin, our health in general, our joints, our, right. you know, gut, whatever that is, we're going to get a, 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 a cascade of, of, of bad effects. Um, yeah, so it's important to know that one system is, is connected to another. Um, yeah, and even like talking about lymphatics, right, you're talking about inflammation. I mean, one thing that I learned in my career for 10 years as a healthcare professional is that most of chronic diseases today is inflammation, chronic inflammation. I mean, it's a source for a lot of things. And I was going to say too, like one of the things that I learned pretty early on in my lymphedema training is that when somebody has lymphedema for a long time, right? At first it is soft fluid. It's an interstitial tissue fluid. So you can feel that it. it's soft. You probably seen it when somebody has an injury, you have that soft fluid. Mm -hmm. but then over time, the skin, the tissue becomes itself becomes harder and we call that fibrosis. So mm -hmm. that's basically it really, or another word for it is actually inflammation. So there's a doctor in Sweden and what he has found is that over time, the lymphatic fluid becomes so inflamed that it actually turns into fat. It becomes harder tissue. Wow. So for those patients, the traditional lymphatic methods like massaging and doing compression is no longer working because we're not dealing with lymphatics there. We're dealing with fat now and inflammation. So he started creating a technique where he actually um, suction all of those hard fat, inflamed fat, not just regular fat, um, suction it and protect the lymphatic vessels. Mm -hmm. And then it will allow the patient to have, they have more normal lymphatic drainage again. Because when you have those hard tissue in the arm, it actually costs you to have, um, you know, lymphatic um, obstruction. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of similar to even with, you know, we talk about fascia tension, right? Because with my patient that has radiation, 
in their breasts, for example, you will see that the skin becomes harder Mm -hmm. and then the lymphatic flow becomes slower. So again, we're kind of talking more generally now, but if you think about the tension that you have from trauma and the tension that you have from different accidents that you may have, um, surgeries that you may have, right? You don't think about all those scars. Like you said, the scar tissue built up. And then you think about the patients who may keep going back to more surgeries. Imagine mm-hmm. how much scars accumulated in those tissues and then how much lymphatic disruption is going to happen, right? That can be in your face, that can be in your body. But mm-hmm. if it's in your face, I would be very, very careful because remember a third of your lymph nodes is in the neck. And that's, yeah. guess what? That's drain. That drain the most important organ of your body after the heart, which is your brain. Mm-hmm. Well, actually, I don't know which one is more important. I think brain is more important, but <laughs> but when your heart stops beating, you die. So when yeah. your brain stops working, you can still live if your heart's still pumping. So yeah, but it drains your brain. So there's actually, mm-hmm. I mean, I've been saying this a lot, but there's new studies showing that um, when you have disruption in a little glymphatic drainage, you actually can have more proteins build up in your brain. And we know that more proteins build up, especially the amyloid protein, is related to Parkinson's and Alzheimer. Mm-hmm. So, and we drain our lymphatics when we sleep. So if you kind of putting it that together, going back to your first question, how, come, how, how can a young person maintain a good lymphatics? We say diet. We haven't mentioned exercise, but exercise is a good second thing because your exercise moving your lymphatics. Third one is sleep because you sleep. I mean, you know, we're in the biohacking community. Everybody talks about sleep all the time. Sorry, I'm going to say, I think you're frozen. I don't know if I'm still recording, but I'm still recording, I guess. Yeah, Yeah, you're still recording. Oh, perfect. You can just cut that part out. Yeah. Um, But I was just saying that, you know, like with the glymphatics, you know, when you're not sleeping, you're actually creating more clogs in your lymphatics. So, you know, right now when you're young, you think, oh, I only need four hours of sleep. I mean, you in the biohacking community, we know that we can measure our sleep outcome with HRV and stuff like that. So I would say that's probably something that you should consider if you want to take care of your lymphatics and glymphatics, better sleep quality. I mean, this is all basic biohacking, right? And there are ways to improve lymphatics. Yes. Um, Exercise is amazing. So because when you move your muscle, muscle pumping actually improves the lymphatics because your lymphatic doesn't have an inner pump, like a heart, you know, your, your circulation system has the heart as a pump, your lymphatics doesn't. So when you exercise, you move the lymphatics, um, exercise in the water is great because water is a natural compression. So anytime you're in the water, you're actually improving your lymphatics. Um, exercise with vibration is great because the vibration actually kind of like activates the small muscles that you have in your body and you don't know you have. And again, muscle pumps, improving lymphatic action. Um, The only thing about exercise is that if you do have lymphatic issues, you may want to go slow into it because you don't want to overwhelm the system just like anything else. So you would say if the, if the lymphatic system isn't optimized, you would be increasing the intensity slowly in order to ramp up that activity. Yeah. If your lymphatic system is not doing well, number one, if it's a lymphedema, you probably need to work with a therapist. If it's not (laughs) lymphedema and just feel like you're more clogged, then yes, you kind of want to do your breath work. Breath is another good thing for lymphatics. I'm going to talk about breath next, but um, Mm -hmm. breath work, you can do um, mild exercise. Trampoline is a great one to stimulate your lymphatics. You can do dry brushing. Walking is amazing. Mm -hmm. More low impact. And then you kind of slowly build up as you pay attention to your body. And that's something that most people don't know how to do is that they just want to rush hard Mm -hmm. and not watch their body, you know, because your body will tell you, I'm telling you. And how does breath work uh, kind of, you know, combine with, with lymphatics. So when you do diaphragm, diaphragmatic breathing, your diaphragm is right underneath your rib cage, right? Mm-hmm. So when you do that, your rib cage expand and contract, expand and contract. And so between your diaphragm to your pelvis, house all of your GI tracts, your GI organs, including mm-hmm. all your lymphatic organs. So your spleen, your kidneys, your gallbladder, they're all here. Your system, mm-hmm. Kylie, which drain your, both of your legs is here. Mm -hmm. So when you do deep abdominal breathing, you're expanding and contracting this whole region of your Mm -hmm. trunk. So that stimulates the lymphatic. It creates a suction here to, you know, like to start the process. And remember a third of your lymph nodes is in abdominal. So when you're stimulating Mm -hmm. abdominal, you're stimulating your powerhouse of lymphatic system. And as a lymphedema therapist, 
I used to think, what, breath? There's no way. My patient's leg is so big. There's no way that breath can change that. Mm -hmm. So it was 2019 when I became a believer. There is a new technology to image the lymphatic system now called the ICG green. So basically scientists discover a way to inject IC, um, green dye into your body. And then that green dye will be then transported to your lymphatic vessels. And then you can image the arm or the leg under near infrared light to see the lymphatic vessels. Mm -hmm. So I did a course where they brought the system and we were doing some experiments. So my coworker got to be the test subject and she started doing abdominal breathing because she's a yogi. Mm -hmm. And I kid you not, I'm going to say, I see the lymphatic vessel starts boom, boom. It's just such flashing and it just start moving. And I was like, okay, I'm a believer now. Breath work is so important. Yeah. Very interesting. Very, very interesting. And obviously breath work is very important for many, many different functions. Um, if anyone's following us on Instagram, they saw me do some breath work before I'm, I go into an ice bath. And, the, uh, and that kind of also what convinced me as far as how important uh, breath work is for resilience in general, which obviously we need in life, because going into an ice bath, whether you had, you know, adequate breath work before or not is enormous. It increases the time you can be there by doubles it basically. And obviously breath work, we can, we can uh, load our system with more oxygen, which, which improves energy production, which improves how your cells function. Um, yeah. So definitely uh, it's, it's just another, you know, maybe that's going to be another trigger for someone to, to start doing breath work. Yeah. So, and, you know, because, I mean, not everybody can afford the expensive lymphatic treatment, right? Because, yes, yeah. you can afford it. If you go to a manual lymphatic drainage um, therapist who knows what they're doing, it's amazing. I mean, mm -hmm. even I've been hearing a lot of therapists, they got um, referral from doctors who wants them to see post-COVID patients because lymphatic drainage helps stimulate your immune system and drains the lymphatic, right? And if you think about COVID, it's all inflammation and it's all clogging the lymphatics because you're bugging your immune system. Um, so you, yes, if you can afford it, that's great. If you can't then do all the basic things that we talk about, you can learn how to do your own self lymphatic drainage because not mm -hmm. everybody can afford the body ba the balancer pro. I mean, the balancer pro is a great tool, but it's 15,000 yes. to $30,000. I mean, who can pay that right in the day to day stuff. So that's yes. why the basic that are free is so important for us. And the balancer pro, if, if someone doesn't is not aware of what it is. Uh, and there, it's not the only system. There is a Nordatech. There is a few of them, which are basically, they look like a suit. They look like a, a like a, yeah, like a basically it's like a like jacket a suit. that has like a chambers yeah. and air channels inside. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's so funny because now I actually work for a pneumatic pump company. <laughs> mm, really? <laughs> so yeah, so I'm very familiar now with pump technologies because I have to learn it. Um, but yeah, Balancer Pro is great. It has really great technology and it has a jacket and a pantsuit that you can put on and it squeeze and release with air and it helps to stimulate your lymphatics in a beautiful way. But yeah. again, it's very expensive. Um, if you go to lymphatic drainage, it's also, I think if you get hands-on, it's the best still, right? Because depending mm -hmm. on your therapist, they can give you true feedback. Like Balancer mm -hmm. Pro is great when you are no issue and you're young like yourself and you just want to get lymphatic st stimulation. But for somebody who has lymphedema, has scar tissue and different things, I would say working with a therapist still might be better at first. And then you transition over to something like Balancer Pro that you can do at home. So yeah. Understood. Yeah. And obviously that's if you can afford it. And if not, you know, working out, um, doing some, some uh, breath work, maybe exposing yourself do, is there is there any information really about like uh, cold exposure and, and lymphatic uh, system? You know, there's not a ton, but I think the the idea is that your cold exposure stimulates you into like a more a parasympathetic release, right? Mm -hmm. And when you're in a parasympathetic um, state, your lymphatics does work better because like you're relaxed and you actually can filter things. But we haven't done a ton of studies because with lymphedema, we actually don't want them to be in a extreme temperature yes because you don't want to like the idea and we haven't really tested this because again with lymphatic lymphatic system right it's also new like all yeah. of our technologies and stuff like that is probably in the last 10 years because 
For a long time, doctors think that, oh, the lymphatic dumps 90% of its content to the vein. So we don't have to study the lymphatics. We're just going to study the vein. Mm -hmm. But we find out that that's wrong. 90% goes back to the lymphatics. And that's why now we need to study it more. And now there are more investment in the area. But lymphatics is one of the most understudied system, I think, in the whole body. I mean, doctors only get two-hour lecture on it. That's why you don't hear about it. Exactly. And maybe that's what we should be. Uh, that would be one of the systems that we should make maintain an, in, a, in an optimal state since we really don't know what the long-term effect of, of abusing that system is, unless obviously we can talk about end, end case scenario or extreme scenarios like lymphedema. But really, if we want to live long, healthy, if we want to look and feel great into our 90s and 100s, we really want to preserve those systems functioning optimally or else we're going to be dealing with problems which we're not even aware of right now. Um, so, Emilia, I really appreciate uh, you taking the time and, and coming on the podcast. Um, what, where would uh, people would be able to, um, you know, reach out to you if they want to get treated? Where would people be able to follow you and get the beautiful information that you uh, that you provide? Um, so currently I'm only on social media as the lymph therapist. So it's at the underscore lymph underscore therapist. I am rebuilding my website. I used to have a website and then I shut it down <laughs> because it was getting overwhelming. So I'm um, working on getting it back up again. So I will have a website soon, but in the meantime, yes, you can find me on Instagram. If you have any question, I'd love to talk to you. That sounds great. And obviously we are going to see each other in uh, July, awesome. in, July yes. in, in KetoCon. Uh, if anyone's going to KetoCon, make sure you, you track Emilia down and, and pick her brains. You're going to be also in the uh, biohacking conference uh, in September. September, September in LA. Yeah, so it'll be in nice. In LA. Uh, so very looking forward to, to seeing you next. And I highly, highly, highly appreciate it time that you gave that you gave us today Amelia. Thank you. Thank you very much.